that case, then why don't we take this out of there? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I'm ready when you are, actually. Yeah. And we're broadcasting. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Krishna Odai Kumar, one of the faculty members of medicine. And it's my uh, pleasure this afternoon at DCRI Research Conference to introduce Professor Wang Tianyin, uh, who's visiting us from Singapore. And we're very glad the timing worked out for him to be able to come speak with us this afternoon. So uh, Professor Wang serves as the executive director of the Singapore Eye Research Institute, or SERI. He's also the Provost Chair Professor and Head of the Department of Ophthalmology at the National University of Singapore and a Senior Consultant and Chief of Ophthalmology at National University Hospital. He's more recently also taken on the daunting task of becoming the Group Director of Research for Sing Health, where his office plans and coordinates research strategy across eight institutions, including two general hospitals and five spe subspecialty centers. Uh, he's previously been the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology and the managing director of the Center for Eye Research Australia at the Center at the University of Melbourne, and he remains a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Tian Yun's training was done at uh, the National University of Singapore, as well as Johns Hopkins University, with postdoctoral training fellowships at Hopkins, as well as the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, in addition, he completed a clinical medical retinal fellowship at the University of Sydney. He's published more than 600 peer-reviewed papers, received more than $40 million in peer-reviewed grant funding, and has been recognized internationally with numerous awards. Uh, I won't go through them because he'll run out of time to speak then, but uh, I will mention more recently in September of 2010, he, did, he received the President's Science Award in Singapore. So we're incredibly glad that Tian Yan could, could join us, and he's actually going to uh, talk about two topics today over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, the first is going to be a more uh, research-oriented uh, talk about his own work in uh, retinal vascular imaging, I believe, or maybe something like that. Yeah. And the, the second is going to be more at the institutional level about the growth of the Singapore Eye Research Institute uh, and the success factors in, in getting it where it is today. So please join me in welcoming Tin Yen. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me actually this? Uh, let me see whether it's on. Are you able to hear me quite well? Oh, yeah, OK, all right, thanks. So I, I think uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to share uh, really two talks. Uh, one uh, on my own specific research area, which I think has relevance to uh, understanding how we have developed uh, and are in the process of trying to test and validate a biomarker. So uh, some of you would work in diagnostic uh, tests and so forth, and there's a lot of challenges, and I'll tell you that uh, we certainly are not even halfway there yet, despite the uh, many ways in which we thought that we will get success, essentially. So I think diagnostic tests will be one topic using retinal imaging uh, as a way of looking at that. And then the second, I think uh, I was told to kind of give a bit of experience of what we've been doing in Singapore to build an eye research institute that is quite uh, uh, competitive in the broader global landscape and what were some of the success factors that we thought were important to share, I think, uh, from, all, uh, from uh, everyone here. So I start with the problem of why are we interested in a particular topic and I think that uh, from all of you here you will, un you will understand this quite well you need to really tackle always a big problem and that problem must have many unmet demands uh, uh, and unmet needs essentially right and so one of the big things about cardiovascular disease is that we are constantly still looking for that pathogenic pathways and so forth I am not uh, going to talk about the different pathways, but in one particular aspect is this whole aspect about microvascular pathways, right? So there's some thought that, you know, uh, if you're looking at, uh, let me see whether this works, yeah. If looking at cardiovascular disease, you either involve the large vessels, the carotids, for example, or you involve the small vessels. And this microvascular pathway in particular is quite important in people like women. And there has been a lot of debate about why do women get cardiovascular disease even though they do not have the typical macrovascular problems uh, 
that uh, are seen in men, essentially. And one of the thoughts was microvascular pathways. And I think the other thing that is uh, lacking or that I think is important in cardiovascular disease is always looking for better ways to predict cardiovascular disease. Of course, there's a very famous article uh, that has been often quoted, which is that 50% of your cardiovascular risks are not detectable by the traditional risk factors, right? And I think there's a little bit of misquote of that article. But nevertheless, there's still that search for that missing cardiovascular risk paradigm. What can help predict cardiovascular risk better? I think that's the two big issues that we have done there. And of course, the, the third thing is, what do you, how do you predict prognosis? So someone who has a heart attack or a stroke for that matter, are you able to predict who dies or who gets better, who, gets, uh, who needs more aggressive treatment, who gets less treatment? So these are really broad issues that uh, when we looked at the landscape, we thought were important to, for us to address itself when we look at this topic. And last, can we improve treatment? Are we able to have more personalized treatment? Uh, is one type of drug better than the other? And I think that that's, again, another gap in cardiovascular disease. So when we looked at this, we had uh, one possible uh, solution. And really, it came to me because, you know, I'm an ophthalmologist, so I look at this often. And this is something that, you know, we see all the time. And I think one of the problems in specialized medicine is that few if none of the physicians or cardiologists ever look into the eye anymore. Uh, you know, in the days when everyone was a general physician, you do that, now we don't, right? And when I look at this topic, which I kind of spent mom, um, almost 15 years of my uh, academic career looking at this link between the eye and the heart, I'll tell you that the ophthalmologists were not interested in it. They could not operate on it. They were not interested whether a person died or not as long as they had the cataract surgery done, I mean, who cares kind of thing. So it's very interesting, right? So one of my first awards or recognition for this came from the American Heart Association in, uh, with a young investigator award early on because, you know, it was accepted as a nice, novel uh, method but was of no interest to the ophthalmologist. So I think, you know, what one lesson maybe for some of the younger people here is that you do need to understand bridges and links between really disconnected few because it could be, you know, it could not be that obvious uh, for, for you when you look at it. And I think that we are all know uh, as physicians that, you know, the blood vessels in the eye are clearly the most visible vessels that you can see. And there has been many investigations trying to measure carotid, brain, and MRI and so forth. And it's not even as close as you can get to see the blood vessels, as you can see in the clear media through the eye itself, right? So this is, you know, just one of the pictures that we are uh, looking. And so I think that's when we thought maybe it could look at and tell us something about cardiovascular disease. Of course, one of the main issues was when you looked at this, it's a long historical context. Certainly, you know, if you are able to go back to early observations, early literature, right? you will find that many of the things that you think are new, actually the concept has been there for years, centuries, uh, if I, I may say so. And of course, Marcus Gunn, uh, who was a neurologist, uh, described some of these kind of changes in the eye, linking it with stroke and kidney failures right in the 1800s, right? And that there wasn't a photograph, it was just a drawing, as you can see over here. And about 50 years later, of course, that progress is long, right? 50 years later, Keith Wagner and Barker therefore then looked at and suggested without much statistics, right? This is just elegant showing exactly, you know, uh, systems that can be adopted, right? That if you have people that have a lot of problems, right? A lot of different signs, group four, basically your months, you know, after the first examination, they passed away. And those that were uh, very little uh, signs from hypertension, would live longer, right? And of course, you don't need p-values or anything at that time, but it was now what is really classic uh, survival analysis, and that has shown that this system has withstood many years of test of time of being hypertensive retino retinopathy. Then there were also those studies that started linking pathologically, and, and some of these studies could not be done 
in some of the modern era because you don't, you can't you know get biopsies and so forth uh, you know and but they, they started putting up some of these pieces together but it was really you know, with the introduction of imaging and a technology of photography that we were able to therefore capture better the whole retinal vasculature that I think this technology started gaining traction and momentum and the idea is very simple right that if we know that there are many different risk factors. As I said, 50% of those are the traditional risk factors, blood pressure, lipids, and so forth. And then there's a whole bunch of things that people have been trying to look at. C-reactive protein being a very famous one, but a whole bunch of interleukin, homocysteine, and genetic factors, right? Being things that you do not know, but all of them will lead at some stage to actual vascular damage before you get a heart disease and stroke and I think the idea is that we are not interested so much in the earlier part but whether we can capture this before the development of clinical disease so that was a concept that we went and tried to say could we use retinal vascular imaging as a way to measure subclinical or preclinical disease before there was clinical development of symptoms right and if that was the case then maybe you are closer to the pathology itself. So that was what we need to do. And over those uh, uh, 12, 13 years that we started working on it, we did many things, and I'll just share with you some of the findings. First, we developed from photography software with computer science and engineers who could measure more quantitatively some of these changes. And I think that, of course, sp speaks about the importance of interdisciplinary research. Because, be because before that, the computer scientists would not be interested in looking at the eye. I mean, they'll say, what's so interesting? You know, it's a blood vessel, we can segment it, but it doesn't tell us anything. So we worked with the computer scientists on that. And the second was that we applied this on the large population studies that could take some of these uh, photographs, uh, and, and we found a lot of correlations there. And we found that it was associated with a whole range of subclinical cardiovascular disease, and that it predicted clinical cardiovascular disease. I'll share with you some of those findings so you understand what I mean. And allows different things, for example, differentiation of stroke subtypes. One of the important things about stroke is that when people have stroke, it's sometimes very difficult to know whether they have the small vessel stroke or the large vessel stroke. And actually retinal imaging in one of our papers really allow us to separate out those types of strokes more clearly than uh, you know, uh, than if you just base it on clinical science alone. So I think that was quite uh, important for us to understand stroke pathogenesis. And I think that now we're trying to see how is it going to be used in the clinical setting. And as I said, there are many challenges here which I'll share with you some of those findings. Now, once we looked at that, the first thing we did was to develop a system. Could we use the old system or the new system? And we kind of went back to ground zero and said, let's just look objectively at the science. Which had the strongest association of science? How do we describe the science? And we went through looking at systems of measuring some of these signs. Because without measurement, it's quite difficult, right? And so we said there were localized signs, signs that really started at uh, uh, focal areas of the vessels, signs that uh, uh, occurred at the junction between the arteries and veins, and signs that were typical of like diabetic retinopathy, uh, that uh, some of you will be aware of. And then we started measuring and saying, how do we quantify some of these signs in a more uh, objective pattern? And this shows you an artery that had some focal narrowing, uh, uh, an eye with multiple signs here, microaneurysms, uh, AV nicking, and focal narrowing. And then, uh, of course, a sign that uh, some of you might have seen before, particularly in medical school, about cotton wool spots that is a sign of ischemia and actually it's one of the strongest signs of stroke that we found in our studies itself. And of course, this is another sign that happens. And then, as I said, we developed software uh, with our uh, computer science engineers, uh, and that started with work uh, almost 15 years in development, knowing how to measure the changes itself, and what do the arteries and the veins mean, and then we developed multiple versions of it, and it became a bit more automated, and then it became, uh, uh, you know, it could differentiate arteries and veins automatically rather than us having to annotate it. So that's what happens. Then we applied it to multiple studies. Uh, a lot of it, the studies were started here in the US, uh, uh, the ERIC study, 
uh, which is uh, conducted in four communities in the US. Uh, UNC, in fact, uh, uh, is one of the coordinating sites of that study. Uh, and then we looked at some of the findings. So let's try to see what did we find itself. Right? So one of the th first things that was surprising was this whole concept that these signs are common. Now, why is it important? Because if they were rare, then it is not that useful as a screening tool because you don't want to take a photograph of 100 people to discover that maybe one person might have that sign. In fact, these signs were in the 5 to 10% range of, uh, uh, of uh, in the general population. So I think that that was quite encouraging in the sense that there were subclinical disease that was seen in the eye in people walking around without any clinical cardiovascular disease itself. And I think some of us were not sure how do you talk about this. We described a term called non-diabetic retinopathy because they were also seen in people without hypertension so we, we, and people without diabetes. So we weren't actually even sure how to name some of these signs itself. Right? And then subsequently, we, we looked at these signs and we found that they were predictive of incident stroke. And this was one of the earliest paper. And we found that the people with no retinopathy, you can see over here, had a 0.7% three-year cumulative incidence of stroke. And those that had like a cottonwood spot would have about tenfold higher incidence of stroke. Again, without even doing multivariate analysis, this is just showing frequency itself you could see that the pattern was emerging from there. And we found that the pattern was very similar for congestive heart failure and other diseases itself. Uh, there was some interaction between retinal and cerebral signs, which you can expect. So if you had uh, a person had both MRI signs of small vessel disease and retinal signs of microvascular disease, then the risk of uh, stroke went up to 18-fold uh, compared to someone who had healthy uh, MRI scans and healthy retina. So I think that's when we started su suggesting that maybe a combination of brain and eye scans could give us much more precision of detecting whether people develop a clinical stroke or not. We found they were associated also with cognitive change, so there was some functional changes that was associated with these signs that suggest that even if there's no uh, uh, clinical manifestation they were actually having some microvascular changes that was affecting function uh, uh, in the brain. Uh, and, uh, and then we looked at uh, some of the quantitative changes itself, uh, seeing how we could quantify the retinal vessels and was strongly associated with hypertension. And what you can see here is quite a good precision of measuring these diameters. This is the veins, this is the arteries, so the arteries went down and became narrow with higher blood pressure, but the veins did not change. And that really was a concept that some people suggested that if you take the ratio of the two, you could get a quite nice AV ratio of uh, a measurement of the effects of hypertension. Uh, and, and I think there was some uh, interest in that. We've also applied it with different ratio groups. And one of the advantages of doing it in Singapore is that you can look at three ratio groups simultaneously which is what we've done here, Chinese, Malay, and Indian, suggesting that the behavior of the vessels to increasing blood pressure was similar across the three ratio groups itself. Uh, it was also interestingly associated with past blood pressure, and this was when we also suggested that maybe the retina was telling us not only concurrent blood pressure measurements, right, which will be nice, not that useful because if you really wanted to know the blood pressure, you measure the blood pressure rather than look, take a photograph. But it was telling us blood pressure levels 5 to 10 years prior to the photographs that was being measured even while we were uh, looking at controlling for the blood pressure at the current levels itself. So it was giving us a bit like an HbA1c, uh, a maybe a measurement of, uh, of sustained blood pressure damage that suggested that this was much more useful than a current blood pressure measurement. So we found lots of interesting uh, associations. And we actually found something really interesting along the way, and people started wondering what it was, that the veins, which is not always uh, appreciated by car cardiovascular people, because they were always interested in the arterial supply, was associated with many different uh, 
uh, associations itself. So one of the first things that we looked at was the associated with inflammatory factors. In fact, a strongest link between C-reactive protein and venular caliber has been seen not only in the general population, but we've seen it in people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, people with HIV uh, and uh, SLE and so forth. So suggesting that the veins could be a measure possibly of inflammation, whereas the artery is a measure of uh, hypertension. And so we are starting to see differentiation of the uh, differences between the arteries and veins. It was also associated with endothelial dysfunction, uh, carotid artery disease on that site. And then, I th as I mentioned, it started telling us a little bit about stroke subtypes. So I'm going to uh, run through some of this quickly because I want to go towards the translational part. Now, what we did over time was that we said, were we, sub were we interested in just this area of research or could we extend it a little bit further? So the first thing that we did was again looking at the blood vessels and saying, you know, is it telling us all the information that, uh, that we need, right? And I think uh, when you look at the circulation, you, you, it's not haphazard. The retinal blood vessels is not there because, uh, you, you know, it was just that way. It, was, it had a very, very interesting and physiological cause there. And I think when it started deviating from the cause, what we started measuring was this whole fractal dimension, the pattern as well as the self-similarity of the vessels itself. And when we started looking at it, we didn't know what we would find. But what we found was also a very interesting pattern that if you have a suboptimal uh, a fractal, so you either have a very high fractal, which is, means that it's very dense vasculature, or very sparse fra fractal, which means a very sparse microvasculature, you are at a higher risk of stroke. So this was something that was also uh, interesting, suggesting that you need an optimal kind of circulatory system that is seen in the eye for you to, be, uh, to have a healthy uh, 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 cerebral vascular system. And so we've kind of seen that with different subtypes as well. And so we've also analyzed this fractal analysis with different uh, uh, studies. And then we looked at different parameters, tortuosity, and so forth. So I think the main part of uh, the issues of translation now comes to this. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of nice papers in very good journals. And of course, uh, a lot of research fellows were very happy. They got papers. People getting, started getting grants. And then I think the question comes in. What do you do with this information, right? What do you do? How can this go into the clinic, right? So one way would be to say, why don't you put this camera into a cardiologist's office? Put it into a neurologist's office. But who's going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be more cost effective? Is it going to be better than the current existing technology? So we're facing these kind of very tough questions once we have kind of gotten very robust clinical and epidemiological findings, right? Something that you will find in your own research, right? So we started thinking, how can it be useful? And I think one of the first thing we did was to speak to people, speak to the cardiologist, neurologist, and said, what would retinal imaging be useful to help you? What would you be interested in looking at? And in fact, there were three areas, right? The first is that maybe it might tell them a bit more about mechanism. So some group of people said, I don't think it's ever going to be useful in, re uh, in clinical prediction, but it might help me in understanding whether a particularly condition has microvascular disease, right? So someone suggested, and we're doing this, in fact, with an industry partner, uh, who was interested in this, they wanted to ask, does Alzheimer's disease have a microvascular etiology, right? They weren't interested in whether or not you're going to use retinal imaging to predict Alzheimer's, but they were asking whether or not could vascular medication have an effect in preventing Alzheimer's. So I think they were interested in mechanism. And I think that with that kind of application, then this tool becomes a mechanistic research too, but nevertheless would have some uh, usefulness in research, I think. So that was one of the things that we looked at. The second thing was, and in talking to people was, could we use this to help us in shortening or being more efficient in looking at clinical trials? 
as you know, if you're going to do a cardiovascular trial, you need 10,000 people, 10 years, to get sufficient events to differentiate a 10%, 15% effects between two statins or something like that, right? That's basically what you're going to look at. So, of course, companies therefore select winners rather than try to try out their five drugs. So, could this tell us something about the effectiveness of drug before you need to do this 10,000 study. So this whole idea of surrogate endpoint kind of came about essentially. And of course, I think there is still this whole group that maybe it might be useful to look at it for you know, prediction. So let's look at some of those challenges. I think the first thing we did was seeing biology. And we looked at, for example, in genetic study, we did uh, a, a typical GWAS of looking at that. And what we did was that when we found some of the genes that were picked up from looking at the retinal vasculature, we found that they were also associated, for example, with stroke and with coronary heart disease. And, and those signals were not seen in the large cardiovascular disease GWAS studies. What it means is that maybe it went by a microvascular mechanism, but certainly I think you know, it helped provide some clues towards uh, a microvascular pathway for cardiovascular disease. So we thought that was quite interesting. And then I think a lot of the people in hypertension suggested it might tell us a bit more about the biology of hypertension, whether or not vent ventricular hypertrophy could have a microvascular pathway and so on and so forth. So I think that again was one of the contribution of this imaging technique to the research literature. Now I think that we were interested in whether or not this was possible, whether or not if you're going to have a treatment for stroke and you need 10 years, 10,000 people, whether or not this means that you could do it in less time. And I think we have started some of this work uh, looking at, uh, you know, kind of seeing whether a blood pressure agent could have a better effect on the vessels before you start saying, let's do it in a major phase 3 randomized trial. So we've done that and we've also looked at other uh, techniques. For example, this study is to look at preventing cognitive uh, impairment with aspirin and we've included a retinal imaging study there so that we could probably get one year results without waiting for you know, 10 years before you're going to get real Alzheimer's disease. So these are things that we have kind of applied to uh, collaborators around the world. Uh, uh, in fact, NIH and NIDDK is also interested in looking at these techniques as a measure of uh, microvascular complication, kidney and eye and so forth. So we are also working with them uh, to see whether or not you know, they, it could be useful for the diabetes world. Now when we went to the clinical practice, I think we were faced with several things, right? One was that, uh, you know, in some of the guidelines, uh, they said, yeah, you could do this and you could, you know, measure photographs. But, you know, it's so difficult to kind of translate something because you could have guidelines that say you need to take a photograph. But where are you going to get a photograph? Who's going to analyze the image? What do you do with the images? What are you going to do with the information? Is it going to change clinical practice? So I think, you know, this thing, it's very attractive and has you know, garnered a bit of media uh, attention uh, and so forth, saying you know, it's quite a nice technology. But when we, uh, and, and there seems to be a bit of a strong rationale. But when we started saying, do we use technology like this? We started going, it needs to go through similar phase like in testing of a drug, right? Testing of a tool or a biomarker or an instrument, you have to go through some of these things. And the two biggest hurdles we found was does it have incremental value to existing technology as well as does it have utility beyond uh, the uh, association that you have found, found. And I think that this is big, basically the biggest gap in epidemiology and in clinical practice. And I think that we have found this uh, challenging for the last five years, as I said. A lot of you would go into this kind of phase. You'll find very interesting statistically significant, robust associations, and yet you aren't able to prove clinical uh, utility and incremental value, right? Uh, which is, you know, whether or not it goes beyond the above risk factors, and does it change individual risks so that the physicians will take that information and say, I'm now going to do something different. And that, I think, is quite challenging itself, right? 
So we did that with stroke, and we found uh, interesting, but not sure whether it's that uh, significant result. So basically, what this suggests is that when you measure retinal vascular caliber, and you classify stroke risk into three groups, low, medium, and high risk, and you do retinal imaging on everyone, you will reclassify 10% of this in, from the intermediate group into either low or high risk. All right, so in other words, someone who could be on intermediate group and maybe would be started on statins, for example, right, could be more aggressively treated or could be less aggressively treated based on retinal imaging because they might not be on statins. Now, is this... Uh, Sufficient? Is it useful? I think you know, you're going to have a hard time convincing a lot of neurologists whether this is something that you know, they will put into the practice. So it's not that simple to kind of uh, uh, look at. And when, what about looking at this, right? So if you have Framingham risk factors for predicting stroke, okay? Uh, you know, the C statistic, which is like an area under the curve, it's about 70%. It's not bad. It's not perfect, obviously. But if you add in C-reactive protein, you increase it by less than one percentage point. But you know, a lot of people are thinking maybe C-reactive protein is a way to add that in. If you read, add in the retinal measures, you increase it by 12 percentage point, which is significantly more. And actually, adding retinal measures, Framingham, and C-reactive protein does not change that. So it does suggest that maybe if I wanted to do something in people with diabetes, where you expect that there could be a microvascular stroke etiology, maybe retinal imaging could be a way of improving the prediction of stroke rather than other biomarkers like C-reactive protein. So I think we have kind of worked on some of this data, but you know, again, seeing whether or not it would change clinical practice has been quite diff difficult. Now, what about this? How does it compare? Right? This is a paper that suggested that for cardiovascular disease, you can add everything here troponin, uh, you know, NT-pro, BNP, cystatin C, C-reactive protein, all the biomarkers, it adds about 10% to the cardiovascular risk stratification. So you could say maybe the retinal imaging is not so bad. In this group, we would have, have a 12% increase in the ROC curve, whereas if you add all this stuff there, maybe you get about 10%. So I think it is a challenge to predict cardiovascular disease with the novel biomarkers, even though millions of dollars have been spent on NIH grants trying to look at these kind of things. And most of them have been published in New England Journal of Medicine as well, and still we're not getting that kind of prediction that you need. So I think that that's a lesson that we are learning, and we are trying to see how we can do better. So I think what I've kind of shown in the last uh, maybe half an hour is that uh, we have developed a nice technology it has been useful in understanding mechanisms. It has been useful in saying that this technology has uh, very interesting features that uh, may be, you know, hypothetically better than some of just looking at risk factors itself. But you know, uh, and uh, the software will Im in, uh, will improve. The technology is non-invasive, so I think there are many things that really go for it. But you know, some of these are not easy to translate, and I think I've kind of like shown you some examples of why it is difficult to translate this. So I'm going to stop here and maybe take some questions on this. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. So I thought uh, some of your concepts about um, looking at the uh, retinal vasculature as an insight to uh, drug or therapeutic development is quite interesting. Uh, we're always looking to find the magic pathway that uh, would be more efficient to getting um, approval on yeah. and delivery of therapies that could be beneficial. What's um, has there been uptake uh, among? Um, drug developers uh, for that concept, or what's because uh, uh, yeah. certainly oh, in the yeah. lipid ring area statins, right. there have been some pitfalls where people use, say, carotid intimal thickening, yeah. um, where it looked very promising, and it turns out mm. that didn't work yeah. for the drug. That's right. So I think that's something that we have been talking to industry. I think that it's difficult to do this, right? Because we have talked to many industry partners and. Uh, those that are in ophthalmology are not interested in this cardiovascular stuff. Those in the cardiovascular stuff just don't seem to understand how to get 
they, uh, you know, how this set up. For example, if they want to do a trial on this, they're going to start saying, you know, I have all my partners and my CROs working with cardiologists and so forth, right? And they, have, they do all these trials all the time. How am I going to add a complexity that these patients therefore now need to take a photograph with their ophthalmologist colleagues and therefore then, you know, have these images read? So we are facing those kind of challenges. But I think for small investigator initiative studies like those that I've shown you, we're able to do it. It's the large farmers that I think has the most relevance and the most to benefit because you could probably make a decision at one to two years. In fact, six months, we are showing differences between agents of ACE inhibitors and calcium ch channel blockers, right? So particularly for either uh, drugs with strong, uh, with, with differences in action, you could can a study or you could stop a study or you can make at least a decision about a study uh, and not extend it with more costly. So that's the value proposition. But again, it is, uh, uh, you know, as in any new technology, not easy to, to get it implemented. Yeah. yeah, thanks for your presentation. It's very clear and, and very precise. Are, are there any advances in uh, the uh, ophthalmoscope yeah. viewing technology so that it can be a little bit more ubiquitous yeah. and so that you can capture these images not through just a, an ophthalmologist but yeah. through an internist, for yeah. example, or, or okay. a cardiologist? So there must be some of these, you know, uh, 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 camera capturing devices that yeah. are so micro that you could put it on yeah. on, on the ophthalmoscope. Yeah. So I think that's exactly some of the work that we are doing. I have not been able to show it because uh, it is quite a lot of groups are interested in this. A lot of groups. And of course, one of the first thing is that they do not believe the direct ophthalmoscope will be of use in the future, right? Because that will be a, basically going to be a camera kind of device. So you take a picture and you view it on your computer and they'll tell you whether you're papilledema, those things that physicians need to know, right? Whether or not you can find the disc or not is uh, irrelevant, essentially. So I think that things are, are, are going to happen uh, actually quite soon. Some of the earlier machines, the resolution are not so good. Uh, there are those that uh, we're talking to. In fact, some of the ophthalmology people here are working on it, whereby they compensate for motion and so forth, like those pictures that have stability device. That's important. So I think they're, they're trying to put a few things together, and pretty soon you have something that will be able to capture and will be transmitted to a computer screen. I think that's what it will be. And you see a picture and you say, okay, that's, uh, your retina is fine. And these kind of software will therefore be incorporated there. And then you get an index of chronic hypertension or you, you know, severity of disease. So I think it's just that it will take a while. You know? And I think when we were starting this, we, were, we, we, we keep thinking like all those people, right? You get major publications, high impact factor journals, you're going to change practice. It's still, after 10 years, it's a struggle, I'll, I'll tell you that. Anything? No. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, Sari, tell you a little bit about SERI because I think some people were interested in what's happening in Singapore and uh, what we what we do in uh, in the Eye Research Institute uh, that uh, uh, you, you know that we have some lessons for people trying to I, I think do things uh, uh, or set up programs and so forth. Right. Okay. Right. So. Um, so the Singapore Eye Research Institute, uh, uh, it's relatively new in, uh, in the global picture. It's about 15 years. We, we celebrated 15 years just last year. Uh, but uh, one of the more, in fact, one of the earliest research institutions in Singapore and even in the uh, Asian countries itself. Because most hospitals do not set up research institutes. It's expensive. They do, they do not know why they're setting up uh, things, right? And, it's, uh, and some of the lessons we've learned was that when we started the eye center, which is like the Duke Eye Center here, do you need a research institute? And really, the government wasn't sure. Uh, it was you know, debated, what are we going to do? You know, where are we going to find the people to do the work? 
what are we going to find that is not being found uh, across the world, particularly in the US. So a lot of Asian countries uh, and other countries, right, that are developing their programs always suggested that, you know, we could just do, uh, we take whatever uh, NIH has donated to humanity and, uh, and take those results essentially, right? So that's, that was a concept uh, from a long time ago. Uh, actually, the SERI now has been quite successful, and I'll kind of share some of those uh, uh, success it, it itself here, right? So we started off, uh, as I said, 15 years ago when we said maybe let's build an eye research institute. That was before any other research institute started. And it supported the research function of the hospital, I guess, I guess not unlike you know, Duke and DCRI and other entities supporting uh, you know, the hospital and the clinical departments itself. We now have about 200 people, uh, 14 research groups, uh, and each uh, research group have their own area of focus. And we bring in uh, a budget of about 20 million a year on, uh, and mostly on competitive grants, but some from industry and some from other sources itself. I think our strategy is very uh, clear, um, and we have avoided, number one, expensive basic research. So we said that we would look at trying to bring, uh, going to where there's a fa interface between the basic scientists at preclinical stage of research. So we would not uh, have people look at, um, for example, very early stage research. They, they needed to be in late stage, late preclinical stage, and we started investing in non-human primates and then you know maybe mice and so forth but not anything beyond that in other words we hardly do any uh, uh, mechanistic work uh, uh, and so forth and I think that that was one of the strategies so and then the, at the interface we also had pairing between the clinician scientists and clinicians together and one of the first uh, uh, groups that we've started was that if we had an interested clinician that wanted to do research, we paired him uh, or her with a scientist and that started one of the, these research groups and we have done it successfully for many different research groups. So this is kind of how uh, the whole structure is organized. I won't go into many details, but basically there were research groups which were like based, uh, which, were, which had a clinician scientist, a scientist and they kind of come together for a program that they would form a group. And the diseases are very specific for uh, their expertise, and I'll show you some of those things. On the right-hand side would be where we started building the supporting platforms, so the, uh, like the DCRI kind of functions, those statistics, data management, uh, um, things that required uh, cross-discipline uh, work, we, we built it over on the other side itself, and these are different kind of uh, groups here. And then when we started saying, how do we get them to intersect, we had this concept that is now uh, you know, a matrix kind of concept so that there were people, they were running the platforms, right? So there were those that were involved in looking at population health, the animal models, statistics, and they would run this across the different research groups that will intersect when they need to the different uh, 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 platforms that we have kind of built. And when we started looking at this over the last 20 years, we, we have, I, I think we are, we are relatively um, uh, successful for a few things. Number one, we, we tried to publish our papers, and, uh, and this paper, in fact, was uh, quite uh, uh, useful for us. It kind of got us a lot of publicity, uh, got us uh, some uh, um, government... Uh, awareness uh, and this was done some by, by some other groups which looked at um, number of papers in ophthalmology journals uh, number one by the size of the population of course US was number one uh, as you expect but when you they look at by per capita then Israel and Singapore uh, were quite high on the list uh, in fact Singapore was number one for that thing and then we looked at papers that we kind of slowly built up over time uh, but a very important thing that we wanted to do was to benchmark ourselves with uh, some of the bigger uh, uh, departments and institutes uh, that we were kind of 
comparing ourselves to. So uh, this is uh, uh, UCL or Morpheus Eye Hospital, uh, which is a big uh, department uh, uh, in, the, in London, and then uh, Hopkins, Harvard, and so on and so forth. So I think we've kind of always suggested that if we're going to do something, we will try to do it uh, properly. Um, this shows a, a splattering of papers uh, over there, and then we've also tried to uh, publish outside of ophthalmology to make sure that you know, the impact is beyond that. But I'll share with you some of the strategies. The first thing was that we've always suggested that we would be focused on diseases that we were competitive and not diseases that we were not. So myopia, as you may know, is a big Asian problem uh, occurring uh, uh, particularly in the Eastern Asian uh, countries, uh, Taiwan, uh, to a lesser extent, China, but Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, we had very high prevalence of myopia. So we had a lot of government funding because they were concerned about young people getting myopia, how they are going to serve the military and so forth. So, so there was a lot of attention on that. And we built models where we could do mice and human research itself and then going towards uh, clinical trials. And because of that, I think we have a very nice model where our myopia research is as competitive as any group uh, looking at, uh, at this disease itself. We've also focused a lot on epidemiology, particularly Asian diseases. Uh, and in Singapore, we have the uh, fortunate, uh, uh, I, I think, the ability to study in one single location, three racial groups relatively easily, right? Chinese, Indians, and Malays, which are like Southeast Asian people. And this is really the three big major ethnic groups. And that allowed us really to um, capture and understand some of the different diseases. And you know, these are some of the slides there, which I won't go into. Uh, the third was that we looked at glaucoma. When we looked at glaucoma, we also focus on a particular type of glaucoma that was Asian uh, affected. So it's angle closure glaucoma. So we built programs among imaging. And then we have now started looking and been able to do genetics of Asian glaucoma, which could not be done actually in US or other uh, places. So I think that was also, I think, important for us. Uh, and and uh, this is the group that kind of uh, looked at that. Uh, we've extended that for AMD. And there's now some sense that macular degeneration is not universally treatable with some of the agents that's developed here, which you, know, uh, which you might be aware of, the anti-VEGF agents that's now quite widely used in US and Europe. But the effectiveness were not that successful in Asia. And so we have kind of looked at that. We've also been uh, successful in trying to look at diseases where uh, we could collaborate with engineers and other people that were interested. And so uh, we've kind of looked at you know, devices like this, uh, and then uh, uh, this is for corneal transplant and for ocular drug delivery. Uh, and then we've looked at other things uh, uh, such as this. This is a reading center. Uh, as you may know, people in ophthalmology would need to uh, you know, send photographs traditionally to Wisconsin and then uh, subsequently to places that became competitors in US like Duke essentially right and Hopkins uh, and a few other places New York and then they found that when they wanted to do trials in Asia uh, the sites were not responsive to the demands of Asian sites because you know of the time difference so forth so a guy that you know so it was too difficult for them to send photographs and images to Western science. So we took the opportunity to build a reading center for Asia that allows us to be able to, to be the site for those kind of uh, uh, trials uh, and reading center. And so I think we have been quite successful in doing that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I've mentioned a little bit about that. And the last thing that I thought was important from Seri's perspective was that we went into an area that was very difficult for other groups to do around the world which was to have a very strong foundation in non-human primates, which is basically monkeys. And, um, and because of that, we've been successful in getting um, industry and collaborations from around the world 
um, working with our monkeys, which are, we have a whole huge uh, breeding colony and so forth, because it's been, uh, you know, complicated, right? Getting monkey colonies in other parts of the world, including Australia and US, is not, you know, you don't have that many colonies and there are m many different restrictions there. So I think that this is kind of, you know, a bit of a summary of, you know, our work uh, in uh, Singapore on the Eye Research Institute. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Time for a couple of questions. Yeah. And so I, I admire your, uh, your vision of uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, so my question has to do with how do you, how do you link uh, your institute with cardiologists, neurologists? I mean, this is a whole other space of yeah. area. And, and so uh, in, in doing this, uh, there has to be that kind of linkage to a, another discipline in medicine, which yeah. has to be just uh, uh, Herculean in scope, trying to, uh, yeah. you know, find that yeah. kind of link. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think there's no easy answer to that. I think it's just uh, going out of your office, talking to people, uh, you know, it's the hard way, right? It's the easy, you can say it's the easy way, it's a traditional way, it's basically going towards uh, uh, to different people. And we have been successful, I think one of the reasons why our group has been able to publish many papers has been that we, we have been very active in our collaborations. We have sent our fellows to conferences that were not directly relevant to them, right? So we have people going to cardiology meetings. I've gone to American Heart Association meetings, even though I, ha I don't understand most of the stuff there. But, you know, it's, uh, it has allowed us to build some collaboration. Yeah. And I think you can't escape from that. I think we are now in a very subspecialized world that really does not allow, uh, you know, you could develop really solid technology in one that would have been amazing for another field. And if you have not been able to do that, then I think you lose opportunities, you see. Yeah. A bit here. So, uh, related to that, now that you're the group director of research across a very large, you know, essentially public healthcare yeah. delivery system, how do you take the lessons learned from the 15 years of this, the I Research Institute and translate that to, to work at a comprehensive level in a setting that has incredible pressures on it to deliver clinical service. Yeah, okay. So this is like a, this is kind of like a very tricky question essentially. Maybe I'm being assessed here, but, uh, but let me uh, give you my, <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you two things, right? So we have done one, we have done basically two things, right? The first is that we are certain and uh, that we can't do everything in Singapore. And you can see that the things that we have done here are very specific, very focused on things that we have either strength in or we have a particular uh, area that no one's going to do. And I think that, you know, if you look at the Singapore scene, you know that uh, we have strategically positioned ourselves in Singapore for gastric cancer, liver cancer, some of the things that are not commonly seen, for example, in the US that, you know, that could be you know, if we're going to go to breast cancer, we'll never make it, essentially, right? So I think that's important. So we have to pick really solid uh, niche areas that we have a chance to be competitive and globally competitive. I think that's the first thing. The second is that we do need stronger partnerships with the basic scientists, I think. And, and that's where I think that links, uh, I think you, you know that with the... Uh, with pairing clinicians with scientists, it's quite important. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's something that we are kind of working towards because uh, uh, it, it really, it, it's, uh, uh, it's very complementary, you know. Uh, uh, scientists, I think, sees things in one way. Uh, I think clinicians give a different perspective and yet the scientist gives a, a rigor to the, to the clinical question that the clinicians sometimes do not see. So I think you, you have to bring groups together. 
I, I, I think it's uh, relatively successful here, but I think it's the same challenges, right? Yeah. So. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.